Hi everyone and thank you for joining me. Today I've got a very special guest that I'll be introducing very shortly but before I introduce him we live in a time and we live in an era of information sometimes over information. The issue is how do you decipher between the information that is accurate and correct and factual and the information that is completely bogus made up or even created by trolls that are existing just to confuse people at this stage because we do have those believe it or not um, I want to share not from my experience but from an expert's experience because it, it is really important and incumbent upon all of us to get educated get informed and understand because that is the only way to combat fear is to have education knowledge and broaden your horizons because fear doesn't exist where you are enlightened, right? So I've invited this special guest. He's have to, he basically, I begged him to come on, on, on here and speak from his experience. He's got over um, a, a decade and a half of experience in laboratory experience as a PhD uh, microbiologist, as well as a PhD in immunology. But he's not going to share his name, or his picture. What he will share is some of his, some of his slides and um, the information that he has contained within those slides based on his years of experience. And he's just gonna share some of his opinions as well as, as his, his expertise in what's happening and, and then you decide for yourself um, whether you need to let go of fear or whether you need to hold on to it. That's completely up to you. That's a choice nobody can take away from you. You have the privilege, the right, and the responsibility to act however you wish with the information that we share. This information is and not meant to be uh, doctor's orders or uh, medical advice because it is general. It is not specific. Um, and um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Anonymous. Uh, bear with me one second, please. Are you there with me, my friend? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Um, so just uh, want you to share your knowledge, your expertise with people. What is happening? I mean, obviously, you're going to be sharing some information that may go against the narrative. And, uh, and that in itself could be potentially a threat for an academic like yourself or for someone in your position and stature uh, for all sorts of different attacks from what I mentioned earlier as trolls, but also from the academic institutions and the other things that are out there. We've seen people get discredited that are doctors, that are, that are professors, um, that, that all of a sudden um, risk their livelihood um, just because they're going out and sharing information that is contrary to the narrative. Um, do you think in, in your expert opinion that it is justified that we have lockdowns and that we have um, some of the uh, enforced measures that have been happening, not only in Australia, but around the world. So at, well, at the beginning of the year when this first started, I think like everyone, I was a little bit cautious about how to interpret the news that we were getting. And initially I was asked you know, what my opinion about COVID-19 was. And based on the limited information that we had at the time, and, and I'm thinking January, February, I wasn't too concerned based on the preliminary data. But of course, as the news cycle ramped up COVID and it was in our face every day. You mean the fear cycle? The fear cycle. <laughs> yes. Uh, there, was a, there, was a, you know, there was a period of a, a few weeks, I will admit, where I was you know, walking back my initial thoughts and, you know, taking a closer look at the information and, you know, giving, I guess, giving due respect to the fact that this might, I might be wrong. Right. And we all need to consider that in humility. We all need to all uh, just take a step back in whatever it is that our opinion is on any topic and just think, what if I'm not right? Or what if I'm wrong? Or what if there is more information that I can take on board that can help me form a better picture, perhaps a bigger picture. Oh, I agree, and I think that is something that is, as time marches on, you know, now 2020, but over the last 10 years, the, the independence of inquiry has been lost by many people. More and more people 
when you do engage in conversation about any topic, whether it's this topic or others, tend to be able to recite the news narrative. But the moment you ask a question that delves a little bit deeper, that there's usually one of two reactions. One is, no, you're talking rubbish uh, because that's not what I've heard and that's not what people are talking about. Or B, oh, really? Um, and, and that you do get the chance to, you know, to talk through some issues. But more often than not, sad to say, the response is, you don't know what you're talking about. I think I've seen people do a lot more of that and run away because they're afraid to be wrong. And usually the more intelligent they are, unfortunately, the more they're likely to run away because they don't want to admit they're wrong. And that's, that's a little bit sad because that's where I think their ego is hijacking their, their factual uh, capacity. <laughs> well, I, I can say I've seen it through it, you know, with academics, but I've also seen it at the other end of the scale. So, it, yeah, we're all, obviously we're all shaped by our own experiences. Um, but I think it's a sign of, a, well, certainly in science, it should be a sign of a good scientist who's capable of critical thinking to always be able to take a step back and go, what if I'm wrong? Mm. And throughout the last nine months, I've engaged in many conversations and email exchanges. And even though, obviously, I have a particular interpretation of all that's going on in the data that's out there, it hasn't stopped me with some of the responses I've got back making me question, am I right about this particular piece of information? I'm still continually reevaluating where I sit. But the difference between the beginning of the year and now is the voluminous amount of material by scientists who are more eminently qualified than I am in the fields of, you know, the same fields that I'm in, microbiology, immunology, but epidemiology and, doc and doctors, because doctors aren't always in those categories. Sometimes doctors are doctors and you have the scientific researchers that hold the PhDs, whatever. There's not always overlap. I mean, of course, there are doctors that fit into that. Um, so you've got a wide range of health professionals now raising some serious concerns about all that has happened this year. And from the beginning of the year to now, uh, yes, I reevaluated for a little bit, but just continually reading every day uh, all that I can get my hands on, that doesn't, you know, I will look at, you know, the mainstream news, but I will, I, I think I feed myself more on what is appearing in the alternative news. Now, there are alternative news sites that I have looked at and read through either it's written material or it's a video recording of something. And within a few minutes, the people or the text will say something that's clearly scientifically wrong. And so that is an example of, okay, this particular piece of information, I'm not going to evaluate any further. I can discount this. But that's not the... I mean, I have, I have people that I work with will say, where did you get that information from? And if I say I got it from such and such a website, they'll say, oh, that's just fake news. That's false news. And the reality is, if you're going to engage in critical thinking properly, you can't do that. That's, you're discounting the possibility that something might be right. Mm -hmm. Now, just to use an analogy, we do this a lot with, with politicians. Most people have been brought up in a household and they tend to vote the same way their parents did or their friends vote. And there's, you know, people can go their whole lives and not change who they vote for. And so when politicians come on the television, we reflexively say, oh, they're from the opposition camp. They're, nothing they've got, you know, they're idiots, they're this or they're that. And that's a pure ad hominem attack based on the fact that you just either don't like the way they look, you don't like the way they sound, or on the basis that they might have said something silly in the past. Or you don't like their party because you've got loyalty to the opposite. That's right. So you've got these ingrained loyalties. Sure. But the reality is 
that just because you've seen a politician stand up and say something that you don't like or you disagree with does not mean that the next time they stand up and speak publicly that they haven't got something useful to say. Sure. And so we have to resist this temptation to silo people and stereotype people. And the same goes with alternative media. Mm. We can't just say, oh, because I saw this on Breitbart or some other website, um, that it's rubbish by default. So we have to look at everything. So that's what I've spent a lot of this year doing. And I have found in the alternative media, and I say that with a very broad brush, that we have plenty of well-trained, respected individuals whose research and qualifications exceed my own, raising the same concerns that I have. Sure. And it's getting dismissed. Some cases we're seeing that some of this stuff is getting taken off Google or YouTube. Um, and that's a an issue. I mean, there's a good chance this will be taken down too. But what we want to share or what I'd love for you to speak to is do you think from your experience and what you're seeing and the numbers and the facts and the science that things are adding up and they make sense and that we need to be taking these measures of people be, being locked up in isolation and, and all those other measures? No, so I, I'm very firmly of the view that the measures that have been taken are extreme and unnecessary. And to, to put it bluntly, the cure is worse than the disease. And that's, that's a phrase that's been used by many people. So just on where the data sits at the moment, the Centre for Disease Control in the United States, I'm going to refer to the slide that we've got on the screen. This data was published in September, and, and of course this data will change and the numbers will change, but this is a snapshot in time. And I just want to explain some of what this data means. So the R0 value, or R, R0, I say R rho, which is incorrect, but R0, is a numerical value that describes how many secondary infections you could expect from one infected individual. So at the moment, the best estimate from the CDC on the rho value, or the R0 value for SARS-2, which is the cause of COVID-19, so really the virus is SARS-2, COVID-19 is the disease, um, is 2.5. So one infected person going about their normal daily lives, family interaction, work interaction, shops, could be expected to transmit to two and a half individuals. Now, how does that compare to other things? For example, measles has a row value of somewhere between 14 to 18, and whooping cough is about the same. So one infected person in those diseases is going to infect somewhere between 14 and 18 individuals. It's very, very transmissible. So this is right down at the other end of the scale. Sure. The other factor of this is deadliness. And before I get on to the deadliness, which, which for most people relates around the death values or the rate of death, just for comparison, let's talk about normal influenza. And a lot of people want to compare SARS-2 to influenza. They're both RNA viruses, but they're actually classified quite differently and their life cycles are different. So in some respects, the comparison with influenza is not justified depending on what attributes you want to focus on. Nevertheless, because influenza is a seasonal thing that we're very accustomed to, uh, it's worth comparing the rho value for SARS-2 at 2.5 to the rho value for influenza. And I'm talking about seasonal influenza not pandemic influenza. So we're not talking about 1918 or 1967-68 and specific occurrences or swine flu in 2009-10. Just your average seasonal influenza. Now, the reference material for this is pretty varied. It actually, I've got on this slide here that the row value for influenza could be uh, typically somewhere between 1.4 and 2.6. But I have seen references quoted as high as three, and I've seen references say that it's as low as 0.9. The reality is that it changes seasonally depending on the virulence of the organism. It changes depending on the population you're assessing. And 
all of, all of those socioeconomic factors and the country and all the rest of it. So that's why there is a wide range of row values published. However, just as a snapshot, you can see from this comparison that while SARS-2 is 2.5, we can have years of seasonal influenza where it could be as high as 2.6. And as I said, some references talk about it being as high as 3. So in terms of spreadability, how likely it is that this gets passed from one person to the next, it is not that significantly different from influenza. All right, so that spreadability doesn't deal with you know, sickness, illness, and death. So let's have a look at the figures from the CDC. Now, these figures refer to the infection fatality rate. The infection fatality rate is not the same as the case fatality rate. So, for example, if you were to simply go to one of these statistics websites and look up for any country on the planet how many cases of SARS-2 there's been, or COVID, it's really SARS-2 infection rates. So how many cases of SARS-2 SARS have they had and how many deaths have been reported due to SARS-2? If you divide the deaths into the number of cases, what you're getting is the case fatality rate. But that doesn't take into account the ability of some of these diseases to spread asymptomatically. It doesn't include those people. When you include all of the asymptomatics and the estimate being used by the CDC here is that there's a, a 40% of people will come into contact with SARS-2 but not show any signs or symptoms. That's the figure they've used in this calculation. When you add all the asymptomatics into the number of cases, of course, the denominator gets really large and the numerator stays the same. So the percentages drop quite significantly. So the case fatality ratio is fairly inaccurate and it's, it's the infection fatality rate is what we're really interested in. It's a much more accurate depiction of what's going on. So these are the numbers that the CDC has published. So if you're between zero to 19 years of age, as a percentage and you get SARS-2, your chances of dying is 0.003%. And that is sufficiently close to being zero. If you are between 20 to 49 years of age, the chances of getting, so it's not getting it, it's, it's getting SARS-2, your chances of dying are 0.02%. If you're between the age of 50 and 69, the chance rises of getting it and actually having something happen is 0.5%. And if you're over the age of 70, it jumps dramatically to 5.4%. Now, I don't think that's telling anyone anything they probably haven't heard indirectly, and that is that older people, especially those who have some other underlying illness, are at most risk. And if we just look at that group of people a bit more closely, the CDC have worked out that... Um, the average age of death in this group of people over the age of 70 is about 83, give or take a few years. And if we look at, well, how many people in that group uh, died with COVID and had a comorbidity? And they've worked out that it's 2.6 additional comorbidities. That's additional to having SARS-2. So you've tested positive, theoretically, you've tested positive for SARS-2, but each individual on average has 2.6 other problems. And no wonder we have a very high death rate in this group. And those other problems can include uh, respiratory diseases covering a whole heap of things, um, other infections, so co-infections, circulatory diseases, renal failure, sepsis is... Um, like septicemia, bacteremia, diabetes. And I read something this morning that said one of the, there's a high correlation, especially in the UK and in the USA, of obesity um, as a, also as a factor. Which lowers, I guess, people's natural immunity and natural response to anything, whether it's going to be the seasonal influenza or something else. Well, it has that potential, but I don't want to, I don't want to pick on people who might be obese because in some cases, it's not 
diet related. It's 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 genetic, and, and I'm not a dietitian, so I'm not going to delve too far off on that tangent. Sure. But I don't I don't want I don't want anyone to think that we're sh- you know fat shaming no. people. That's not what we're talking about at all. It's just preconditions. Yeah, pre health issues. So what all this data basically says is that under the age of 70, your chances of getting this and actually having a, you know, the worst negative outcome, and that is death, is very, very small. And the, the additional part of this, and as I said, it's no surprise, is that most of where we're seeing, you know, very poor outcomes is in very old people. Now, the last bit of information on this slide for, for the Australian population is that the life expectancy of, a, of the average Australian male and the average life expectancy is somewhere between 80, 81 years. And the life expectancy for an average Australian female is somewhere in the order of 84 to 85. I think it's worth considering that the people that are dying from this it's, it's not significantly altering what is probably normal outcomes. And that really what a lot of media and, and the reporting and the fear-mongering fails to point out, there is a huge difference dying with SARS-2 versus dying from SARS-2. And they don't make that distinction. Now, as far as then people want to talk about statistics and the death rate and all the rest of it, there was an, um, a study put online from John Hopkins Medical School University in the United States last week or the week before, and the researcher there was looking at all of the statistics that are available from the CDC, and according to the interpretation that she's come up with, the actual number of deaths in the United States is no higher than a normal year. So this argument that the number of deaths exceeds last year or the year before, and, if, and, and then of course the assumption that's being made is if the death rate is higher than the previous couple of years, then what's, what's causing it must be SARS-2. That, that's really the assumption. But what she's pointing out and, and, and again, I, I haven't looked at the data myself, so I have to say with a caveat, if she's right and it seems to agree with what everyone else outside of the media industrial complex is talking about, is that the death rate's no more than normal. And it's not due to SARS-2. Some of the research that's come across my desk is that the numbers of death for last year in 2019 for people that were either suffering from preconditions or that were just expected to die due to natural um, age expectancy didn't die in 2019. So those numbers moved into 2020. So people actually lived longer than expected. So let's say they had a, a precondition like a cancer or something that was, you know, they'd been given two or three months and they were going to die at the end of 2019. They didn't die then. And they, they're still alive or they potentially are dying in 2020 um, as a result of living a bit longer. And I think that's what's driving some of the numbers in the US. Well, I can't say yes or no, but it makes sense. So, for example, I've heard one researcher talk about uh, Sweden in particular, or Sweden and the UK, and the number of deaths attributed to SARS-2. Now, before we talk about deaths, one thing people need to be aware of is that doctors filling in medical, well, sorry, not medical reports, um, death certificates, really, um, well, let, let me go back a step. Most deaths do not get autopsies, okay? Autopsies take a lot, a lot of time and effort. So most deaths at any given time do not get autopsies. And when a doctor fills out a death certificate, is it is really their best guess of what's gone on for this individual. That's what diagnosis means. Yeah. <laughs> so they all they can do is take into account the person's medical history, both their long medical history and their more recent medical history, and they have to make an assumption about what caused this person's death. So without autopsies, 
people need to understand, and, and I, I'm aware that in the United States that there were rule changes around how this was being done. In fact, the National Health Statistics Scheme in the United States sent a letter through the CDC to every physician in the country early on this year saying that the World Health Organization had come up with two death codes to go on death certificates so that they could accurately record the statistics associated with this disease. And I can't profess to remember exactly the codes, but I'm sure it was 7.1 or 7.2, something like that. And 7.1 described where the patient history, the person had respiratory um, distress syndrome, uh, yes, respiratory distress syndrome. They tested positive for um, SARS-2 and they had all the signs and symptoms to, to go along with that diagnosis. So that would be a confirmed, you know, that's reasonably good at saying this person died of SARS-2. The second code, seven, let's call it 7.2. The second code, more or less, and I'm paraphrasing, more or less says that there's no laboratory diagnosis, the signs and symptoms don't necessarily uh, add up to being respiratory dis distress syndrome and a cytokine storm. Um, but we're not going to use this code in the United States. So on, there's no death certificate that has 7.2 on it, saying we're not sure whether this is COVID or not. Every death certificate written in the United States where COVID may or may not be a direct cause uh, has the 7.1 code on it, which says this is it. This is SARS-2. Right. Hence, That's, the numbers are completely out of whack. The numbers are hugely out of whack. Right. And, you know, there's been doctors testify to this, wow. that, that this is what they've been told to do. Sure. So, well... There's the numbers that are out of whack with that, and then there's also the PCR false positives that have been out of whack, not only in the US and other countries, but here in Australia, between the different states, between the different laboratories. Could you talk a little bit to that, um, just explaining why potentially the PCRs um, may show po false positives? Okay, so let's, let's define false positive first. Um, a false positive, as the name suggests, is you get, a, you get a test result that is positive. And, of course, by saying it's false means it shouldn't be. shouldn't be positive. Yes. The issue with, strictly speaking, if a PCR detects the genetic material that you set the assay up to find in the first place, if you find it, it's not really a false positive. The test is positive. So I... To some extent, if we're going to be really purist in our language, it's probably not correct to call it a false positive. So it's not even a positive. No. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, what is unique about how PCR is being used? And, I, and there's been lots of people talk about Kerry Mullis and things he said about, because he invented PCR, sure. and things that he said about PCR and it wasn't intended to diagnose infectious disease. Look, that was... You know, I know, I know some of his comments are more recent before he passed away, but there's been a lot of people take that technology and do a lot of work with it. Sure. So on the one hand, people need to realise that PCR as a technology, if it is done right, is very robust and very sound. And it's been used to diagnose infectious disease for a long time. But not alone, right? But I that's don't... right, not alone. So the difference is that normally a patient goes to a physician with some set of signs or symptoms. Right. And look, I'm going to use genital tract infection here as an example sure. because doing a PCR for either chlamydia or gonorrhea has been around for 20 plus years. Sure. So the PCR is not new. So the PCR for infectious disease is not new. Right. But the difference is a patient with some kind of genital tract problem irritation has signs and symptoms of discomfort, redness, swelling, pain, and they go to the doctor to seek a diagnosis and relief yes. from that condition. So when a doctor collects a urethral swab and requests a PCR for chlamydia or gonorrhea, 
whether the test comes up positive or negative, those results are being related back to the patient's signs and symptoms. Through the lab. Through, yeah, so the lab does the work. They send the results back to the requesting physician. Whether the test is positive or negative, that result is in the context of what the patient's signs and symptoms are. The difference of what we're seeing now is that a PCR has, is being done on people who are apparently healthy, yes. who they have, have no symptoms. signs and symptoms. Right. They're not coughing. They're, they're not, not coughing. They're not sneezing. No temperature, no fever. And if the test comes up positive, that result is being used to quarantine them for 14 days and then contact trace everyone they've been in contact with and have them subjected to a PCR test. And if that comes up positive, they're being put into quarantine for 14 days. Now... Has that ever happened with the history of PCR testing as a diagnostic tool? No. <laughs> no. So that part of it is unusual. That's brand new. Right. Now, where people talk about a false positive is entirely related to the assay conditions. Right. So it's not the fault of the PCR how it's being used. That's purely man-made how, how the assay is being used and how the results are being interpreted. Sure. So let's define what, when people say false positive in the context of SARS-2, let's define what that actually is. And if anyone's done any research on this, you may have come across discussion about the threshold, the cycle threshold. A PCR is simply a a photocopy mechanism. If the target piece of DNA or genetic material that you're looking for is in the sample and, it, it, and the, through the ingredients of the assay, there are something called primers in the assay. The primers are, are man-made. They're designed to find the target piece of genetic material you're looking for. Now, if the assay is well designed, the primers will not bind them to anything in that sample, no matter where it's come from if the target piece of genetic material isn't found, it's got to be complementary. Now, when the PCR um, is run, it initially starts at somewhere up above 90 degrees. And what that does is any genetic material in the sample, DNA strands, it separates the strands. It's then cooled down to a lower temperature. And I've got a slide for this if you want me to show it. So we can find a slide make it easier for people to understand what's going on. I probably should have thought to put the slide up earlier. Uh, just let me find it. Okay. So just to explain this slide then, on the left is a picture of the kind of swabs that are used for a PCR sample. And these swabs or these tubes are dry containers. There is no media inside these swabs because we don't care whether anything dies or not. We're just looking for genetic material. So um, it's not unusual to, to use a dry swab. So in the top of this, the picture on the right, we have the heating step. And this says um, 98 degrees, but it, it's got to be up above 90, 92. Um, we have a piece of DNA that's double-stranded. It has looks like a ladder on its side. And by heating up to that temperature, it separates the two strands. So it's like cutting the ladder right down the middle on every run. We cool that down between 50 and 60 degrees. And the red things in this diagram are the man-made primers. If there is a piece of genetic material in the sample that these primers recognise and are complementary to, they will bind. Uh, we then raise the temperature to 72 degrees thereabouts and the other ingredients we put into the reaction mixture are all the other base you know heaps and heaps of bases to fill in all the gaps from the primers onwards and so what we end up with at the end of this this is just one cycle what we end up with is two identical pieces of dna where we started at one now we've got two that's one cycle now, we, a PCR is all about trying to magnify that so we have enough of it to detect. And so that's where the number of cycles comes in. Right. And this is where we've got inconsistencies between different... That's right. ...testing at different cycles. So I've been speaking to people that have had a lot more experience setting PCRs up. So I'm a clinical microbiologist and, you know, a theoretical immunologist. 
And I, I've, I'm familiar with this technology, but I haven't had to do it myself. But speaking to my colleagues who have, I've had people say, you know, 25 cycles is plenty for, for trying to identify a, t- a target piece of genetic material. I've had other people say, oh, 30 is better. And I've had people say, oh, no, 40 or 45. Well, what's come out in the literature, and this is, again, from the CDC. So people, anyone who's in science, if they want to argue, go and argue with the CDC. Essentially, uh, studies out of Korea and other places have found that people can still have leftover genetic material in their upper respiratory tract for up to 12 weeks following, you know, having SARS-2. That might not mean they're sick, that might not mean they're contagious, but they they still have it in their symptoms. That's exactly right. right. In their system. So when we talk about the number of cycles, if you get a positive result after going past 35 cycles, what pretty much it's it, it seems to be conclusive that what you're picking up is non-viable virus. It's not infective. It's leftover fragments from degraded material. So what the assay is positive. It's not really a false positive in the sense that the assay is detecting something that it shouldn't. It's false in the sense of how it's being used. So anything over 35 cycles is basically detecting non-viable virus particles. So the person is not infectious. But if you then... If you then, well, this is the problem, as you say, labs are all over the world are not necessarily all using the same number of cycles. You might have labs using 30, some using 35, and I happen to know that the assays that are being used here locally are are 45 cycles. Right. Now, so when a person gets a positive result, the result doesn't say how many cycles were used to get that positive result. What we're really interested in is positive results for 35 cycles or less. And they are the people who, you know, if if we're going to take this virus seriously, and and so I think we've overdone it in terms of seriousness, seriousness, in terms of talking about the growth value and those infection fatality rates, I think we've we've gone ridiculous on on those facts. facts. But... For those that want to believe this virus is deadly and we need to do all of this, if we were going to quarantine someone, it has to be uh, 35 cycles or less based on a positive result for 35 cycles or less on PCR. Sure. And and perhaps sitting with a doctor so the doctor could check their symptoms as well rather than just going off the PCR test alone. I mean, would would that hurt to check the symptoms? Well, or do you think maybe they don't have symptoms, but they could actually still have the virus? Well, that's, there's debate around this issue. Sure. Early on, uh, the, the other thing that's really concerning about the events of this year is the number of times we have had the organisations in authority, and so I'm thinking of the CDC and the World Health Organisation, and even you know more local government agencies come out and give information to then have it contradicted a day or two later. The flip-flopping and the change of narrative is extraordinarily concerning because as far as I'm concerned, the truth doesn't need to be massaged. The truth will stand on its its own merit. It doesn't need to be constantly changed and corrected. So, for example, with uh, the World Health Organization, one of their representatives came out in the middle of the year and said that there are countries around the world doing some very robust work to do with asymptomatic, um, whether there is asymptomatic transmission. And they basically said that all the data, and they're doing very, remember, very robust studies, and the data indicates that asymptomatic transmission for SARS-2 is not a thing. It's not important. It's not driving this. Um, But the day after someone else from the World Health Organization comes out and says that interpreting that to mean that asymptomatic, interpreting that to mean that asymptomatic transmission is therefore not important is taking that taking that interpretation too far. It's being misused. 
It's being used to lessen the severity of the response. Damn straight. There is no other way to interpret that. We've had another representative of the World Health Organization, uh, I can remember his name was Dr. Nabarro, come out and say that their lockdowns have a very finite use, a particular purpose, but otherwise the World Health Organization does not recognize lockdowns because of all of the longer term economic effects, psychological effects, um, the, the complete disruption to the normal social fabric. And yet the day after he said that, someone else from the World Health Organization had to come out and say, no, he didn't mean that. It's being taken out of context. The truth doesn't need to flip-flop like this. That's right. Okay. So, I, so first of all, my opinion is that we don't need to be doing PCRs on everyone. We don't need to be doing this extensive contact tracing. But if people want to be err on the side of caution, and we were going to do it, then the PCR has to be restricted to 35 cycles or less. That makes good sense. Well, while we're on this, is corona a new virus? Is corona something that has just come out in 2019 or 2018, uh, sorry, 2019 or 2020 as a result of uh, the Wuhan situation? Or is corona a virus that's been known about and been around as long as mankind has, has been around? Okay, coronaviruses have been around and known about for, for a decent period of time. There are, well, there are, and there are lots of coronaviruses across lots of different animals. Right. So you can get coronaviruses in cats, coronaviruses in dogs, and there are coronaviruses in humans. Now, I'm going to refer to them as common coronaviruses, and there are four main species or strains of normal or common coronaviruses in humans. So they've been around for ages. Yeah. Um, this particular strain of coronaviruses, or coronavirus, is referred to as a beta coronavirus. It's in a slightly different category. And the first SARS virus from 2003 is classified as a beta coronavirus, and this is a beta coronavirus. Now, the first SARS virus, the, the, the narrative that runs along with this, is that it jumped from bats to civets, which is a kind of cat, and then from civets to humans. And so it's quite unique and it's different to the other common coronaviruses. This coronavirus has a lot of similarity to the 2003 strain. Now, if you want me to address where do I think this virus came from, yeah, I'll speculate. I think that there has been a lot of um, gain of function, they call it gain of function research, molecular genetic research that has been deliberately focused at making new pathogens, essentially. So we're talking, why would you do that? Why would you make a brand new pathogen? Well, there's two schools of thought. Either straight up it's a biological weapon or two, you could go back and look at the research that was begun after the first SARS virus came out. And there has been an incremental progression in where that research has gone. And I've read some of the journal articles. And so, for example, one of the steps along the way was taking the original SARS coronavirus and developing a mouse model because it's not convenient to house civets and have to try and catch cats and take blood samples in an animal house. And bats similarly have problems. Wouldn't it be convenient if we could create a mouse model so that we can study it and it's easier to look at and perform all these experiments? And you go, well, yeah, I can see the value in doing that. Um, but along the way, being able to manipulate a strain so that it can infect mice is an incremental step towards where eventually, we, we know that research groups have done this. They've taken um, the genetic material out of the original SARS virus. SARS-1 and SARS-2 infect humans by attaching to a molecule on the surface of our cells called the ACE2 receptor. And what they've done in the laboratory artificially is taken the genetic material 
for the virus side of that link and deliberately manufacture a bat, we'll put it into a bat virus so that a bat virus that couldn't infect humans can now infect humans. It was done and published in 2015 and, it, and then it was further work done on in 2016. What, what a wicked and unfathomable thing that would be if it was done for the sake of uh, commercialization and, uh, and being able to make a buck out of it, which uh, I'm sure there's been uh, multiple things that have happened like that in, in humanity and uh, in, in different societies and at different times. But whether people are aware of that or whether they're not, that's a, a completely uh, different question. The average person has, I think many people think that atrocities with human experimentation ended with the Second World War. Right. But since the Second World War, you've only got to go and have a look at something called the Tuskegee experiment in the United States, where a population of people were deliberately infected with syphilis and not cured and watched and monitored to see what would happen. Well, syphilis is, you know, it goes through three stages, primary, secondary, tertiary syphilis. By the time you get to tertiary syphilis, it's eating your brain and you... It drives people insane. It drives people insane. Yeah. And groups of scientists at... And I'm not talking about uh, people, sort of small groups, breakaway groups doing this. I'm talking about major institutions, major research institutions funding this research, knowing this is what was going on and allowing people to die of tertiary syphilis. And apparently the last person in that Tuskegee experiment, they watched them all die, uh, and they could have treated it with penicillin. Um, The last person died in 1972. But, of course, we didn't hear about it until 25 years, 30 years later when some sort of sealed records come out to say that this has gone on. And I can tell you that, again, through the release of sealed records, that not just America, UK, I think, did this as well, but they grew a bug called Ceratium arsessens, which is a bacteria, and strains of Ceratium arsessens, when they're grown in the laboratory, produce a quite a distinctive red, pinky red pigment. What they did is they, they grew bucket litres and litres of this organism and freeze-dried it into a powder and then deliberately flew around in aircraft over the United States. And I think it happened in the UK, but definitely the United States. And they sprayed this powder at altitude and then watched and surveyed laboratories all over the state or a couple of states where it was done. And every time one of these bugs turned up in someone's infection, whether it's a urinary tract infection or lung infection, bacteria not like pneumonia, sepsis, any time a laboratory isolated a pigmented ceratium arsessens, they chalked that up to, OK, so the wind carried our bugs this far. It was to study the effects of radiation fallout. If there was an atomic explosion, how, where would the wind take the organism? Now, this was done unwittingly. Yeah. And when, the, when this was eventually revealed, I think the early 2000s from memory, there were people still alive who were able to say, well, I lost my father to that infection. Right. The general populace didn't have to know. In fact, it was completely done... Well, it was done completely blind. Yeah. And they've also used um, a fungus, Aspergillus fumigatus. They've released spores in the New York subway sure. to see how the air currents, you know, how far it would be carried by the natural air currents with trains and people moving in and out of the subway. So these experiments are endless and they've been happening for a long time. Oh, they've been happening for a long time. So people are pretty naive if they think that there aren't um, well-funded laboratories. As I said, we're not talking about small backyard operations. We're talking about well-funded laboratories deliberately manufacturing these things. So, yes, if if I wanted to lay money on where I think this virus came from, I think that it did come from Wuhan. And as, as per uh, another researcher, there's a fellow by the name of David Martin, and he's not so much a laboratory researcher as he is, um, has, a, has a computer program that monitors and looks for in emails and, and, and documents all over the internet globally, looks for different patterns. And as he describes it, he looks for 
they're looking for keywords and not just the words, but the context in which the words are used. And as he describes it, looking for anything that blurs the line between um, bioterrorism and where ethics get skewed. And basically, this is his words, not mine. If you ask the Chinese, did you manufacture this SARS-2 virus? They can say no. And if you ask the United States, because there's research labs in the United States that have been well-funded to do this kind of stuff, if you ask them, they can say no. The question that's not being asked, and this is his words, not mine, is did you do it together? No one's asking that question because the papers that I'm referring to in 2015 and again in 2016, the Wuhan Laboratory and a laboratory at or connected with North Carolina University, they're all published, they're all the authors are all from both institutions where they've developed this chimeric virus yeah. that can, it's a bat virus that they deliberately clone to be able to mutated, manipulated to be able to infect humans. So there is a precedent. Can I prove that this strain is that strain? No, I can't. But there is a precedent for having, for it's, it's been done. Sure. Okay, so the only question now is which lab did it come from? And because there are plenty of other researchers talking about the fact that the the supposed mutation from animal from bat to animal to human mm. is has occurred too rapidly for natural evolution for for a natural change to take place. Sure. And finally, is there a particular slide or anything else that you want to share with the viewers? I know this is going to be the first of probably many more series because I'm uh, already foreseeing that there's going to be questions that come out of this that then I'll bring back to you and you might need to come back and answer in a different session. But if there's anything you want to finish up on, because we're coming to the top of the hour um, with the viewers, um, for example, is, is wearing masks. Is that something that's going to protect someone from potentially getting um, this uh, Corona virus or this SARS-2 virus? Um, or is it at all useful? Um, and if we can finish up with what you think people can do to better protect themselves rather than uh, having undue uh, fear? So what I'll, what I'll show, just, just before I answer your question, I'll lead into the answer to that question. This was something that I've been thinking about because initially all the advice that came out at the beginning of the year from all of the scientific, the World Health Organization, CDC, said that masks don't work. Letters were sent to physicians in the United States saying that N95 masks are not to be used outside of hospital healthcare settings and that ordinary masks do absolutely zip. That was the letter that was sent to the doctors. Sure. But then there's been a lot of talk about what masks can and can't do. So it led me to think about, well, let's try and do, look at this from a scientific point of view. Right. So the SARS-2 virus and the original SARS and influenza just from a size point of view, they're said to be 0.1 of a micron, which is um, 0.1 times 10 to the power of minus 6 of a metre, or 0.00001 of a metre. It's a very, very small thing. You can only see these things with an electron microscope. But just to give some people, uh, give people an idea of just how small we're talking about, and I might just need to put this into presentation mode to make the animations work. There's our virus particle on the left. I was sitting at home and I wanted a, a round object that I could say, well, let's assume this is the virus. And what I went and delved out of the drawer was a marble. That marble happened to be 16 millimetres in diameter. So what I'm about to show you is the scale of other things relative to this marble. So if that marble at 16 millimetres is our virus particle or at 0.1 micron, then common bacteria, and this is an electron micrograph that's been coloured, but common bacteria, bacillus-shaped organism, about four to five microns long. Now, to scale this bacteria up, we're talking about that bacteria would then become about the size of, well, probably even slightly larger than a scuba tank. 
because I've got down there about 600 to 800 millimetres long, 60 centimetres to 80 centimetres long, and about 19 centimetres wide. So, to, so this is everything's been scaled relative to the marble. So the marble is the virus. So that's our bacteria. Now, let's have a look at a human hair. Human hairs can be narrower than 80 microns and they can be quite fat. They can be even double the size of that. But the average size of a human hair is about 80 microns. If we scale a human hair up to be relative to the marble, what we end up with is a diameter of 12 to 13 metres. And you can see a fellow standing next. This is a tunnel boring machine that's just broken out. That tunnel boring machine is about 12 to 13 metres across. So that's the size of your human hair relative to the marble. And just to take this a bit further, um, just try and get to the next slide. We have a city skyline here. And what I'm going to show you is the size of a five millimetre grain of rice relative, if we, met, if we bring the grain of rice up so that, so that the marble is the virus, then the grain of rice is going to stand nearly three times as high as the tallest building on the cityscape. Right. So what, we, what people don't understand is just how small we're talking about. Now, so much smaller than, even so much finer than the human hair. So then the chances of it getting you through a mask... Is, yeah, is very easy, depending on the kind of mask. Right. So I'll get out of the uh, presentation and just find the slide that, um, that I'm really interested in. So this one, we'll end it here without me showing. I've got video that demonstrates that masks don't work. But really, this sums it up. This is a, this, you can see on the side of this box, this product is an ear loop mask. This product is not a respirator and it will not provide any protection against COVID-19. Now, this is a surgical mask. This is not a dust mask that you might buy from your local hardware shop. And as it says, it's not a respirator, but it does nothing. So having people walking around wearing masks achieves zip. So I would love, thank you for demonstrating that. I really appreciate the scientific information behind that. I'd love people to contemplate these two questions. Why are certain governments making it compulsory and you get fined if you're not wearing a mask? If this is the scientific evidence behind it, that a mask won't protect anybody against this virus or any virus, that's question number one. And question number two is why then do we have certain governments enforcing lockdowns when we know that that's not the answer? Why would you lock down the general population when the only people that are at high risk are the people that are over 70 years of age and with a precondition of some sort of disease or something that could make them a higher risk? Why would you lock everybody down? So they're the questions to think about whilst you might have some, some closing comments. Well, just, just one comment, that, and, and this is so sad, it's tragic, is that in parts of the world where a second wave has been purported to be occurring, and we haven't really touched on how the statistics are all over the place and incons very inconsistent, making comparisons difficult, yes. but the statistics for this year can't even be compared to previous years because... For example, the CDC has come out and said, we're no longer recording influenza anymore. We're not even looking for it. So we'll never be able to compare this year to any other year in terms of influenza data anyway. Um, but it's insane. It's insane. But just as a final thought about lockdowns, in some parts of the world, um, they're locking down again. And there are stories of older people wanting to commit suicide rather than go into lockdown again. Understandable. And not, and, and not just older people, to be fair, young people as well. Some, some parts of America, university students are being confined to rooms and dormitories for very long period, like days and days. And there was a case that I read about yesterday of a young man committing suicide. It's very sad, the isolation, the loneliness. Um, and, and these are healthy people that would otherwise be I guess, making contact and connection, human connection with other people that are healthy, um, yet they, they have to go into this, whether it's self-imposed or government-forced um, uh, lockdowns that, that 
wind up being exactly what you started with, which is that the cure is worse than the disease. Yeah. So I think, look, there's, there's, we could go on and on because I can talk about the daft, I, I can demonstrate about masks. I can talk about how the statistics um, have been massaged and are not necessarily accurate. We can talk about that flip-flopping and the contrib- you know, the reasons why I think you get these official announcements and then you get contradictions a day later or two days later. We can, we, there's so much we could delve into, but... I think that, that we'll leave it here for the audience to question what's being presented here and come up with their own intelligent answer. Um, I thank you so much for all I can say for now is doctor. Thank you so much for your knowledge and information and what you've shared with us here today. And I will uh, bring some of the questions from the audience back to you and and hopefully get you again for another series. Thank you everyone for watching and uh, be safe, be well, and all the best. Thanks everyone.